So Jeff uh, was a grad student with Carlos Bustamante at UC Berkeley. And I've actually been reading his papers for much longer than I've known him, because um, he was doing this fantastic single molecule work where they were trying to understand molecules like the enzymes that help you know, the DNA inside your cells become uncoiled and unjumbled, um, and thereby allow them to, you know, in um, high fidelity, copy and separate from each other. And um, not only was the science beautiful, but the science was really fun. So like one of the experiments they did, um, they actually used a Lego Mindstorms kit to design the apparatus that was actually manipulating single molecules of DNA and enzymes. And um, it's always a pleasure to find that someone, when you meet them, is actually even more fun than you thought they would be from reading their papers. Um, so Jeff, I met uh, several years ago, and um, and Jeff is the sort of person who uh, takes his craft very seriously. So uh, you know, he is now a, an esteemed professor at MIT. He runs um, a, not just his own laboratory, but he's the, the leader of this group of PIs that, that form the Physics of Living Systems uh, collection at MIT. And to show how serious he is about being a professor, he's the only person I know who has a jacket with the elbow pad. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, what Jeff has been doing since his foray into single molecule biophysics has been no less remarkable. What he's been doing is to think about um, how, how the living systems out in the world around us um, operate. Uh, what rules do they follow and, and how, do they, how do they both integrate signals from their environment and from other uh, species and organisms around them? But you know, what are they trying to achieve? And I imagine it must be a really sort of um, enticing for graduate students at MIT because every time I hear one of Jeff's talks, there's there's some uh, there's some aspect to his science which he's encapsulated in some you know really beautiful concept. You know, so you may hear phrases about cheaters here. Um, his postdoctoral work as a Papalardo fellow at MIT uh, in Alexander van Udenaren's lab, you know, studied a. a uh, realization of what's called the snowdrift game, um, to think about how organisms can both compete and cooperate at the same time. And just this morning we heard some of his work about ecological suicide, you know, which just by itself, uh, you know, conjures up these amazing uh, images of what organisms might do to sort of um, create an environment where they, they themselves get killed off, and that's exactly what what Jeff uh, managed to find in some recent work. So I think what we're going to hear today is uh, this synthesis of, of these underlying rules. And I think what's really exciting as we go forward is that I think it's really just the tip of the iceberg. And Jeff is sort of leading the way about thinking about this. But, but as you and the audience are sitting thinking about the natural systems that you come into contact with, um, I, I hope this sort of uh, uh, conjures up images of what you think those rules might be as well. So Jeff. Well, uh, thanks, Casey, for the wonderful introduction. And uh, you know, it's really a pleasure for me to be here uh, giving this uh, public lecture because I have been coming to Aspen for a number of years, and passed mostly in the winter. And I've always enjoyed the city and uh, the restaurants, the nature, uh, but also all of the cultural opportunities that are here. And so it's fun for me to be uh, up here on the stage and have uh, the chance to have this conversation with all of you. And so the goal for the next hour is to talk about uh, these sorts of games that take place within uh, biological populations. And we're going to start really by thinking about these interactions uh, in more familiar settings, the kinds of things that all of us uh, engage in with each other, these sorts of interactions and games. And then we'll try to figure out, okay, well, how is it that these ideas from game theory might possibly be relevant in trying to understand how biological organisms, like animals, are interacting? And then after we kind of are a little bit comfortable with that, We'll then move to the microscopic realm and ask, right, to what degree can we uh, think of the interactions between these microscopic organisms as taking place in some similar way? And so along the way, I think uh, I'm happy to take questions, so please, uh, please feel free uh, to, to shout out. And uh, in the spirit of the activity, uh, what I thought is that we'd start actually by playing a game. Okay? And the game is, does not have a very creative title but it is very descriptive. Okay, so what I'm going to have all of you guys do is, uh, is get together in groups of three or four. All right, this is also an opportunity for you to meet your neighbors. All right, and as part of that, you should introduce yourself. Right, uh, not yet. All right, no, I'm going to give you the instructions first. All right, now uh, what you're going to do is you're going to be thinking carefully, strategizing, and so forth. 
And then after doing so, you're going to privately choose a number between 0 and 100. This is an opportunity if you want. You can even pull out your cell phone and type it in so you can do a simultaneous reveal. Okay, but the goal here is that uh, you know, you're going to have to find out more of the rules to understand what you're going to be doing, but you're going to simultaneously reveal your numbers. Uh, and then uh, the winner in your group of three or four is going to be the person whose number is closest to two-thirds of the average of the numbers within the group. Many of you guys, I think, you know, someone in your group is going to have a cell phone, and you can do the calculation, and it'll probably be kind of obvious from the numbers who ends up winning, right? But yeah, so the idea is you're going to reveal all the numbers at the same time, calculate the mean of the numbers, and multiply that by two-thirds. Whosoever number is closest to that is going to be the winner of the group. Okay, are there any questions about what, uh, about what we're going to be doing here? All right, now is your chance. Okay, so turn to your neighbors, groups of three or four, and we, you know, we're going to give you a minute or two, but not too much longer. So uh, do... Uh, Sound okay because it sometimes is a little bit it, screechy or something. I don't know if you're talking to someone. Okay. All right, so your group should now be at the stage where you will have be revealing your numbers to each other. All right. All right, you should be identifying your winner in the next 15 seconds. All right. I can tell by who's smiling, you know, how they did in this particular competition. All right, All right we're going we're gonna to reconvene now. All right, could I have the winner of each group raise your hand? All right, and I'm going to point to you, please yell out the number of your bid. 18. We had an 18 that was a winning. How about here? 18, 23, yeah, 55, your group was, okay, yeah. 34, right. 33, okay, you can just start yelling them out, 61, 27, 64, 64, really, all right, the sound feels a little bit, all right, 68, 29, all right, 36, 36, okay, now I'm making up numbers. Okay, I think that, uh, I think that we have some distribution. What's that? 90. Wow, okay. Uh, uh, all right, uh, so, all right, where, so where, do, where do we go from here? Okay, uh, and I think that these are actually typical numbers. If you go online, you can find that there, there, you know, people did this with large number groups, et cetera, et cetera, and yeah, the winning bids are typically in the mid-20s, okay? Um, okay, so, all right, so what is it that we get from this sort of exercise, all right? Well, okay, one thing is that you could kind of apply some sort of induction to come to the conclusion that in some sense everybody you know, like, should have bid zero. Okay, now let's kind of walk through the logic of this. Let's say that everyone else in your group, they were going to be bidding 100, right? And, you know, then you say, well, what should I bid? And you say, well... Not 90 or so. Some, somebody still bid 90. Okay. No, but uh, two-thirds of that, right, is still going to be 
less than 67, because once you put in your number, it's going to go down. Right? But then once you said, oh, if everyone else were doing 67, then what do you want to do? And you said, oh, you'd want to then be you know, at 45. And you can kind of apply this logic over and over again to come to the conclusion that you should have maybe bid zero. How many of you guys bid zero? Oh, only one, really? Oh, that's interesting. Okay. One. <laughs> yeah, like, it's close enough, right? Yeah, okay, so right, indeed, yeah, so zero indeed ends up, in some sense, is the solution of this game. Okay, but on the other hand, you'd say, well, in what sense is it the solution if it's not actually what allows you to win the game? Okay, now I think that this comes to a central point in a lot of these sorts of uh, game theory kinds of ideas, which is that often you are implicitly or explicitly assuming that there's some sort of hyper-rationality at the level of the group or other players, and then you're responding to that and allowing yourself to come to some sort of solution, which in this case, in principle, should be zero. Okay? But, of course, that's not what actual real people do. Okay, so then you say, well, okay, this game theory stuff doesn't even work on people. How is it ever going to work on pandas or bacteria? And I think one, one of the things I'm going to try to convince you of is that in some ways, the assumptions behind applying these game theory ideas to biological populations is actually in some ways more robust than it is when applying it to human populations. And I, I'm going to make that argument more explicit in the next uh, few minutes, but I, I just want to give you a highlight of where we're going. Okay. All right, now this, when I said the solution of the game, right, what, what was I referring to? Well, I was referring to this idea of a Nash equilibrium. Okay. So the Nash equilibrium, for those of you guys who are familiar, John Nash, he wrote this wonderful paper, where, super short paper in PNAS, where he, he introduced this, this equilibrium or solution concept to, the, to, this, to these games. All right, so some of you guys may notice this is not actually John Nash. <laughs> right, but it, it's a, it was a good book and a, and a fine movie. So that's actually Russell Crowe. Right, but you know, John Nash, you know, it, uh, when he was uh, around the time of his uh, later Nobel Prize winning discovery. Right, so what he pointed out is that one, a, a powerful idea in a lot of these games is uh, he didn't call it a Nash equilibrium. Okay, the trick in a lot of these situations as an academic is that first you have to come up with a big idea. That's really hard. But then what you want to do is you want to introduce it and you don't want to give it a good name. Because if you don't give it a good name, then everyone's going to call it you know, Nash equilibrium. Right? If you had come up with some other name, then you know, we'd be calling it. Right? Okay, so indeed, yeah, so now we call it a Nash equilibrium. And it's the set of strategies such that no individual has the incentive to unilaterally change their strategy. Okay. And the way to think about this is, imagine, right, so Thad over there, he bid zero, and he, you know, he felt very good about his bid, I'm sure. Okay. Now, uh, but then he didn't win. All right, but now imagine this. Let's say that all the members of his group had bid zero. Okay, so zero, 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 zero. And the question is, would you as an individual want to change your bid from that? And the answer is no. Because right? you know, it may be that you have to share the winning you know, bid together with all the other members of your team. But if you actually change your bid on your own, then you become the lone loser. Okay. So this is uh, another way of thinking about uh, this final, maybe equilibrium state that you might expect from this sort of game. Okay. All right. Now, okay. But the question is, how could we have gotten there? Right. How could we go towards the solution in the game? And actually, there is a natural way to do this in the context of humans, because actually, if I mean, if I went and had you guys replay the game, we're not going to do that because of time constraints. But let's, you know, how many of you guys wished that you had bid something lower? Yeah, uh, probably a majority of you, right? How many of you wish you had bid something higher? Right, that, you definitely did, right? <laughs> right you know, but um, it's only a minority that would want to bid something higher. So actually, through a learning process, we could eventually move towards zero as well. Because right? if we played the game again, most of us would lower our bids. And through mul multiple rounds of playing the game, you would eventually end up basically at that Nash equilibrium. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so, so that's that's what's going on with people, right? But now we have to ask. Well, okay. So, given that, you know, our, our opponents in this game didn't even bid the technical solution of the game, right? So, in what sense could animals possibly implement? I mean, clearly they're not undergoing these hyper rational. Uh, thought processes that are often assumed in the context of these games. And I want to then explain how it is that these game theory ideas then might be relevant in the context of evolution. Okay. All right, so th the basic idea is the following. All right, so first, you have mutations that, la that naturally lead to different strategies. 
Okay? So in the context of this game, let's just imagine that th your bid was genetically encoded. Right? Just as a result of some combination of genes in your genome, just made you want to say 52. Right? Now, OK, in, in this context, it might be not very plausible. But for many behaviors, we know that there are substantial genetic correlates for. Okay? So in the context of the game, if you imagine it was genetics that told you to do 52, but then your children would maybe have similar numbers around 52, but mutation or reassortment of genes will lead to some variation. Right? So it won't necessarily be 52. It could be 45, 60. Right? So mutations will naturally try out some different strategies. Okay? And now, then what we do is we assume that okay, payouts of the game you know, correspond to some sort of reproductive fitness. Okay? So in this case, we didn't have any particular payout associated with the game. It was really just you got to raise your hand if you were the winner and yell out your number. So that was worth something. But in the context of biological populations, if the payout of the game results in higher reproductive fitness, more children, then that means that those genes and strategies will spread in the population. Okay? And then the last piece of this puzzle is just that there are going to be fitness differences that will lead to evolution towards the solution of the game, in this case, the Nash equilibrium. Okay. All right, so we'll kind of walk through some concrete examples of how this might play out for some actual biological situations here in a moment. So this gets us to the, the point that I made before. And this is a, a quote from John Maynard Smith. Right? So highlighting right, humans aren't necessarily so rational. But actually, in some ways, those assumptions that I specified on the previous slide, in some ways, are a less um, stringent requirement than the hyper-rationality that we, ha we often assume for humans. Right? And this led John Maynard Smith to write this thing here. That, you know, he said, paradoxically, it has turned out that game theory is more readily applied to biology than to the field of economic behavior for which it was originally designed. So I think this is a very strong statement, but actually, it might even be something I agree with. Uh, of course, it's always nice to be able to quote somebody else, so then nobody can you know, claim, that, claim that I said anything ridiculous. Right? Uh, OK, so I just want to give you a sense of, uh, of where we're going for the rest of our hour. All right, so I first want to uh, explain some different contexts in which animal interactions can be described by some sort of game. So for example, I will show you an example where, uh, where lizards are playing something that you might call a rock, paper, scissors game. Okay. Then I'll uh, transition to this idea of cooperation. Where there are many, many contexts in which cooperation within a group is maybe even essential for survival. Yet when you have cooperation within a group, you always have to ask, well, is it susceptible to being taken advantage of by cheats? So individuals that don't contribute to that public good. And I'll tell you about some different examples of that in, uh, in animals as well as in microbial populations. Uh, all right, and then uh, here I'll uh, focus in on this microscopic realm where we can define very clearly the way that these cells, or the microscopic organisms, are interacting as well as what it is that's determining the strategy. Right? When I said, oh, well, maybe your genes are telling you to bid 52, that doesn't seem very plausible. But within the microscopic realm, we can actually look at the gene that encodes a particular cooperative behavior. And we can remove it and see that the cell no longer does that cooperative behavior. So we can really see that there's a direct correspondence between the, the genes that are present and the behaviors that we're interested in. Uh, OK, so uh, one of my favorite examples uh, of uh, and applying some of these game theory ideas to, uh, to biological populations is uh, this very basic question of why is it that half of us are male and half are female? OK, so we're at a physics institute, so the statement is not quite accurate. But, uh, but you know, if you go, go out to downtown Aspen, and it becomes more accurate. All right, so, all right, now, at first, though, when you, when you see this, you say, it's not even obvious that it's a question. Because you know, you'd say, oh, well, there are two sexes, right? You know, there's men and there's women. And why not 50-50, right? I mean, I'll, you know, uh, and, you know, but I think that there's a, another way of thinking about it in which it really is, I, I think, a puzzle. Right? And uh, the, the, the way to think about this is that if, you know, from a very kind of basic level, you know, we think about evolution as something that say, maximizes the growth rate of the population, something like that. Right? And if you go and you ask an animal breeder, you know, how many bulls do you want versus how many like, you know, female cows, you, know, you don't want a 50-50 mixture. Right? You actually want to have a smaller number of, of the male animal in the population because the females are typically the rate-limiting member of the population. Right? Indeed, if you go to look at many natural populations like sea lions, what you see is that 
a very small fraction of the males are actually siring a, a large majority of all the children in the population. Right? So what that means is that if you're just maximizing kind of the growth rate of the population, then you would actually want to have maybe 2080 male females. You'd want to have f a smaller fraction of males than females because there's this large cost associated with males in the population. Okay. And certainly, biology can do all sorts of amazing things. And actually, tuning the sex ratio is not actually the hardest thing in the world to do. So I think that there, is, there has to be maybe some other explanation for why it is that almost all animal populations like that, we're that we're familiar with, almost all of them are 50-50. Or very close to being 50-50, right? And uh, and the the argument here is well, let's imagine that we had a population that was growing, that was that that maximized this growth rate of the population, that had a small fraction of males and mostly females, right? And and you say, oh, the population is then most fit. Okay. Now we can then ask, well, what happens if there's a mutation in the population that leads to more sons being born? Well, you say, all right, that's, that's fine. That doesn't actually change the number of children that that, uh, that organism is going to have. Right? If they were going to have five kids, then now instead of having, well, let's use an even number. So okay, I was saying 2080. All right, so then in, in a 2080 situation, if you were going to have five kids, you would have had one son, four daughters. That would have been fine. Okay, now there's a mutation that means that you have more sons. All right? so for simplicity, say five sons, all sons. Okay? Same number of children. So you might say, oh, the, repro the reproductive fitness or the fitness of that gene hasn't changed. Okay. However, you have to ask then about the number of grandchildren that are going to result. And the funny thing about this situation, if you have 2080 male female, is that the males are on average having more children than the females. Right. So for any average number of children that the females are having, the males are actually having four times as many children. What that means is if there's a mutation that leads to more sons being born, that mutation is going to spread to a larger number of grandchildren. Does that make sense? Okay. What that means is that that mutation that leads to a larger number of sons will spread throughout the population. Okay. All right. So another way of saying this is that that 2080 male-female sex ratio is not stable against invasion by some sort of mutation with more sons being born. Okay. And actually, this argument is not specific to having 2080 male-female. It also works in the other direction. Right? That the only evolutionarily stable state in, in the sense of this sex ratio is to have a 50-50 uh, distribution between the males and the females. Because if you have more of one or the other, then there's always going to be this potential for mutations to arise that push the population towards 50-50. Because as that mutation that has more sons, as it spreads in the population, then it, bring, it pushes the population towards more of a 50-50 distribution. Okay. All right, I'm going to take a question, because I feel like it's a good time. Could I get a water? Yeah. Uh, any, uh, any, you know, and I'm happy to get an, it doesn't even have to be a question, it can be an argument. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? You like 60-40. Oh, in excess of which one? OK, so, right, so you're, you're imagining a situation where there's kind of three boys for each girl. So it's kind of like the, and I worked at MIT. So that actually is the male-female ratio at MIT. Right, OK, yeah, so, the, right. And, and that would be, you know, it's, it's fine. But then, it, again, you can ask the question of, well, what happens if there's a mutation that in this case leads to more daughters being born? Because if, you know, because if it's 60-40 male-female, then now it's the case that, the, that on average females are having more children than males. Right? So it's not, you know, this, this asymmetry between the, it's really just that the rarer sex ha is going to have on average more children than, uh, than the, uh, the more common sex. Uh, there was a question in the back and then maybe here. Yeah. It is unclear to me how the, the ratio of the population would in any way drive a mutation. You're, you're asserting that, that that uneven ratio drives mutations towards uh, a more evenly distributed ratio, and it's unclear to me why well, that assertion. Okay, so yeah, the, the drive. The question is, where is that the drive takes place? So the mutations are random. Right. Okay, so the, there are going to be some mutations that lead to more sons, some that lead to more daughters, right? So that is not biased. Yeah. It's really just that the the situation is just that when it's 2080 male female, it's just that the 
uh, the males are having more children than the females, which means that from the standpoint of a gene, it's better to be in a male than to be in a female because you can then spread more. Right? And, and that, that part is just, that's a mathematical fact. It's just that the males are going to have to have more children because there are just fewer of them and the, ma the nature of, yeah. And maybe last question, then we'll move on. Yeah. Uh, this is an argument. Ah, I like it. <laughs> Yeah, so okay, so I want to make sure I'm understanding. Well, so I think that, I mean, so the argument here is that regardless of whether you're pushed over here or pushed over here, this, um, the evolutionary pressure, what it, we're talking about, it pushes you towards this 50 50. So it's, you're not going to have a situation that pushes you towards one ex, uh, away from the 50 50. Yeah, so 2080 male female, I guess, corresponds and to right here. Yeah, so once, you, once, it, once you're at 50 50, then, and actually, once you're at 50 50, then in that situation, you could have, as an individual, I could have any ratio between males and females, and it doesn't actually matter because the, any, any ratio of male female that I have genetically encoded has the same fitness. So in that sense, once you're here, there's no pressure. To go to go anywhere. Yeah. Oh yeah. So it's not. Yeah. Exactly. So it's not going to dominate. Yeah. Because it only can go till it's 50-50. Once it goes past that, then it then the mutational. You know. Then evolution is going to push you back. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That's important. Uh, of course, any theory like this, it has to do something more than. Uh, yeah. Maybe last one, and then we can. Yeah. Internally modulated continuous system. There's no outside influence of that, yet, right? Yeah. So indeed, we're making a number of assumptions, and I'm going to get to some of them in a moment okay. here. Yeah. Well, because like I'm thinking of in China, what's happened where? Oh yeah. No, no, no. Uh, right. So indeed, um, yeah. So I'm talking about the evolution. Yeah. So I mean, well, obviously, once you can do a selective abortion, then this is not true anymore. So yeah. no outside. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. So. Yeah, OK, OK, all right. But no, but no more after this. All right. Uh, during the Hundred Years' War of um, Great Britain and, I guess, some of the European countries, uh, a lot of males were killed. Was there a natural uh, evolution, if you will, during that Hundred Years, four generations, to have more males more? Yeah, OK, so there, there's, there actually is a, a lot of um, interesting analysis. Yeah, so so I, what I'm describing here is sort of a zeroth order description. Um, there, is a, a th there is some evidence in a number of animals and, and weak evidence, I would say, in humans that depending upon our, uh, basically our, the hel our health state, and particularly the health state of the mother, then uh, the mothers, even without any evolution but just physiology, can modulate the ratio of males and females, basically in the sense that if, if as a mother you are, um, you know, it's, it's a period of deprivation. In particular, there's been some studies during w World War II when there was a lack of food and so forth where uh, during uh, periods of deprivation, it actually can be advantageous to have more daughters because it's a safer bet. Whereas, you know, Genghis Khan had lots of children, right? You know, more children than any woman could ever have, right? So, there, so the, uh, the reproductive fitness of men or, uh, has a larger variance than women. And as a result of that, you can get some interesting effects. But um, yeah, it, that, it gets a little bit more subtle. Yeah. All right, okay, so what I was gonna say here though is that, all right, so this is, you know, and there were a couple of assumptions that were implicit in here. Uh, and any really satisfying theory like this should not only explain the things that we already are aware of, but should also maybe explain or predict some things that we hadn't thought of or that we were not aware of. And I think that a per, a perhaps a very satisfying example of, of this are parasitic wasps. Okay? So there are a variety of, the, of these species, but uh, the common feature is that they basically they lay their eggs um, either in the, the living or the dead body of some insect, and then those, um, those eggs will hatch locally. And for many of these species, 
there's mating within that population. Okay. And what's interesting is that in that situation, it violates one of the assumptions in this argument that was implicit, which is that everything was kind of well mixed. Okay. Whereas in the case of the parasitic wasps, if the eggs are, uh, if they hatch locally and they mate with each other, then the, again, it comes back to this argument, oh, that it may be better to have more females than males. And indeed, a lot of these parasitic wasps have what they call extraordinary sex ratios, right? Sex ratios that are not 50-50, but rather, in a lot of parasitic wasps, they have more daughters because they're going to be mating locally. Okay? So this, in some sense, is the exception that proves the rule. Okay? All right, so let's, uh, let's move on. All right, so that, that's an example of some sort of game, but it's not a game that we are normally are so familiar with. Right? So what I wanted to do next is to tell you a different example of, uh, in this case, these are side-watched lizards that live in the uh, mountains uh, in California. And, uh, and there's been a number of studies demonstrating uh, this guy is uh, what I call a champion rock, paper, scissors player. Okay? Uh, all right, so I want to explain to you how this, how this came about, or the, you know, what the study found. So this was a study uh, done by Kurt Lively in the 90s, uh, and, and then there's follow-up work, but uh, it's analyzing alternative male mating strategies. Okay, so I'll describe how this plays out. All right, so this is what a normal male uh, lizard looks like. And uh, the, the normal strategy of these lizards is to defend a territory and then mate with the females within that territory. Okay. However, there's another type of lizard that is an aggressive type and actually looks different. It has an orange throat instead of the blue throat of the normal male. And this aggressive lizard defends a larger territory and therefore has higher reproductive fitness than the normal male. Okay. And if this was the only thing going on, then we would never see this normal male. And actually, we would only have this one, and we would call it the normal strategy, right? Because it would just have outcompeted. When we went out and looked in the mountains, this is all we would see. However, what Kurt and Cernovo found is that there's a third type of male, which is what's called a sneaker male. And actually, such, uh, such male mating strategies are found in many, many animals, uh, in fish and all, all, all over the place. And these, these sneaker males, they don't defend a territory on their own, but what they do is they sneak into the territory of the other males and mate with the females there. And this sneaker male is actually able to, is, is better uh, able to sneak into the territory of the aggressive male because the aggressive male is trying to defend too large of a territory. So the sneaker male can then outcompete the aggressive male. And then closing the circle, the normal male, since he's defending a smaller territory, can outcompete the sneaker male. Okay. Right. And the amazing thing is that, oh, and I didn't mention the sneaker male, this is actually what a female lizard looks like as well. It has this stripe. Right. So, uh, so it actually, physiologically actually, you know, it, its visual appearance also helps with its reproductive strategy. Right? It's an amazing system. Also, this is genetically encoded. Okay? Sneaker males give birth to sneaker sons. Aggressive fathers give birth to aggressive sons. Nor right? So this really is uh, what I was telling you about before. This is a case where you have genetically encoded strategies. Mutations can naturally alter strategies, but then differences in fitness lead to differences in the ratios of these populations over time. Okay. And indeed, what was done in the study is they, they basically watched these lizard populations in the mountains, and they tracked the fractions of the three over time over the course of seven or eight years. And what they found is that there was an oscillation among these three. Because when one became too very abundant, it opened the door for the other one to spread, and this kind of went through over the course of these seven or eight years. It's, uh, it's really an amazing system. Right now, you say, okay, well, okay, these are animals. So, so I can kind of believe that they might in undergo something like a rock, paper, scissors game. Okay? But what about at the microscopic realm? What about single-celled you know, bacteria that you can't even see without a microscope? Well, there's another uh, system that I think is quite nice that involves uh, toxin production or chemical warfare between bacteria. Right? So what was shown in a number of studies, including this one by Ben Kerr, is that you can have this, what we'll call here, a normal bacterial cell. Okay? And this normal cell can be killed by uh, this red cell that is a toxin producer. So it basically makes a chemical that kills those sensitive cells. And that, again, makes sense. Right? If you can make something to kill your neighbor, then you're going to dominate. Okay? However, again, there's a third type at play, 
which is a resistant type. Right? Now that resistant cell, it does not make the toxin, but it's resistant to it. Okay? Now and you can imagine, in that situation, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be costly to make a toxin that doesn't do anything, right? I mean, you know, we all know that you know, a few percent of GDP devoted to, uh, you know. All right, so, right, so it's costly to, to make toxins. And if it doesn't have any effect, then you're going to be outcompeted. Okay? However, there's also a cost associated with resistance. What that means is that the resistant type can be outcompeted by the sensitive type. Again, completing this circle that corresponding to this rock, paper, scissors dynamic at that microscopic realm. All right. Any questions before we we're going to transition in a moment here to cooperation and cheating? So yes. Just a real quick one. Yep. So when we get rid of a sneaker or a resistance, and you only have two, at some point biologically, is a third introduced? At some points, does the aggressor have a sneaker on accident as a kid? Okay. Yeah. Do you uh, notice that there's a relationship there? That oh yeah. So this is uh, right. So in general, I mean, we typically think of mutations as being purely random. Uh, and you know, from that, but the, the question, question is, well, what is going to be the consequence of a mutation leading to some other type, right? So let's just say that we didn't have the sneaker, and then we then we would evolve just a, an all aggressive population, right? Now mutations are going to happen. Now let's say that an aggressive father gives birth to a normal male, right? That's bad, right? That normal male is going to going to have a tough going, right? Um, so so that that gene, the gene encoding the normal male behavior, won't spread in that population, right? However, if you start with this, if this aggressive father gave birth to a sneaker male, that sneaker male is going to have a higher fitness. And then that means that this sneaker behavior will spread in the population. So it's going to start moving over here. But then there's going to be scope again for a mutation leading to a normal male to arise. Oh, OK. So I should stress, this is not my research. Okay. Um, and here it's very difficult to see uh, this, the, uh, the evolutionary dynamics that I'm describing take place. Whereas here it's not so bad, actually. Because uh, we can actually evolve all these things in the laboratory. Uh, so we can evolve a resistant from a producer and, yeah, and so forth. Yeah. So it's well filled the gap that I'm asking for equilibrium if you get rid of one of those populations. Uh, I think the basic answer is yes. There's, there's always, always subtleties, subtleties about exactly what. Yeah, but I think that um, it, uh, based on experimental evidence, it, is very, it, it looks like this is probably what's happening. Yes? Uh, the, the Chinese decades uh, created their own game and uh, basically we only want male children and you can only have one. Yes. Yeah. So how do you view that that game and uh, how did they mess it up? Okay, well, well all right. Uh, yeah, yeah, so this, this is kind of about like regards right, to this question back, back here. here. So, so um, yeah, yeah, and um, there, yeah, many, many things to say. I think that for Societal happiness, I think a 50-50 ratio is actually a great thing. So that's one statement. Uh, I think that there are a lot of problems associated with having an excess uh, number of males in a population. But um, yeah, and yeah, I, 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 it, yeah, it does actually have to be selective abortion because actually just choosing how many kids you have actually doesn't change the ratio. Right? There's a famous math puzzle where you say, oh yeah, and every family they keep on having kids until they have a son and then they stop. You know, right? So if you have a son, it's your first child, you stop. But if you have a daughter, then you know, you, you, you know, some families go daughter, daughter, daughter until they have a son, right? You guys understand the situation, right? So that actually doesn't change the sex ratio, and it's not quite obvious. You know, you have to think about it, right? But yeah, so so um, so just decisions about whether to have more kids actually doesn't affect the sex ratio. It it has to be, um, yeah, sex specific abortion. Which incidentally, there's evidence that this is this happens in the United States as well. If you look at, uh, there was a, a PNAS paper published five, ten years ago, looking at if families, you know, in, in particular, yeah, I guess, I think it was East, South and East Asian families in the United States, if they had two daughters, and then, the, and then you ask about the sex ratio of the third child, or the, the fraction of boys of, of the third child, that actually, it, it, was, it was almost two to one. So, I, it, so there actually is evidence for this in the United States as well. Oh yeah, the, the question is, is uh, how is it that the sensitive organism is able to outcompete the resistant? And that's just because there's a cost associated with resistance. Right? So it could be, for example, 
that this toxin kills the cell by binding something on the surface of the cell and going in and killing it. And that's a useful something. Okay. But then you can mutate it so that it doesn't, you know, so that you're no longer, you know, you're no longer sensitive to the toxin, but then it doesn't, it doesn't do its job as well. Right? So that's, that's why you can get a cost for something like that. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on. Um. All right. Okay. So here, here are the last part of the talk, what I wanted to do is discuss this question of the evolution of cooperation. Okay. Now this, uh, like many questions within evolution, it's a classic question that dates back to Darwin. You know, this is quite a prophetic looking photo that he has there, right? And on, on the origin of species, uh, yeah, he, he wrote this. I'll read it. He said, if it could be proved that any part of the structure of any one species had been formed for the exclusive good of another species, it would annihilate my theory, for such could not have been produced through natural selection. Really strong statement. It would annihilate my theory. Okay. You know, and of course, he was on to something. He's a very smart person. Uh, but it turns out that the problem is actually much more severe than what he's letting on. And that's because even cooperators, or sorry, even uh, cooperation within a species is a challenge for, uh, for us to understand. And that's because we always have to ask, well, what happens if there's some sort of cheater strategy that arises? Can the state of cooperation survive the possibility of freeloaders? Right, so for example, you know, Dobzhansky is a famous evolutionary biologist. He has a famous quote where he said, you know, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Right, so we really want to take this evolutionary approach. How is it that, so we know there's a lot of cooperation in the world. How is it that it could have arisen? Right, of course, uh, you know, we're at a center for physics, and I'm in a physics department at MIT. And you know, I go to faculty lunch, and many of my physics colleagues seem to believe that Dobzhansky could have gotten away with just the first half of the sentence. And, <laughs> um, you know, and said this, right? Uh, so, okay, so it sometimes feels that this is the case, but I think that it's an overly fatalistic view of the world. So, so what I do is I try to stick with the full formulation and then just see how far I can get us, OK? Uh, all right, so yeah, so what is this, what's, the, what's the challenge? All right, so first of all, we know that there's a lot of cooperation at many different levels of biological organization. And that's true from, from humans down to the microscopic realm, right? So, all of our society, I mean, I, when I, I love just going and looking at like, bridges. There are these huge structures, and I can't imagine how you would actually build such a thing. Right? You, know, and you go out in the world, and you're like, oh, I'm kind of proud to be a human. Right? It's, but it's because we're able to engage in this huge, tremendously complex social organization, right? cooperation across, even with strangers. Right? But it's not restricted to humans. Right? There are a number of different uh, cooperative uh, situations that have been analyzed on, on uh, many different systems. For example, uh, these are meerkats. And uh, one, uh, uh, one of these studies was looking at uh, alarm calls. Right? So the basic question here is, let's say that you're a meerkat, you know, and you look up and you see a hawk or you know, some predator. And, the you know, and you have two choices. right? You can, you can run for cover, or you can issue an alarm call to let your, I don't know, are they nest mates? I don't know, let your friends know that there's the hawk up above. Right? So this would be, the issuing the alarm call is some sort of cooperative behavior, whereas running for cover would correspond to some sort of non-cooperative or possibly, if you'd like, a freeloading type behavior. Right? So you can then ask, right, when is it that they issue alarm calls? Why? Does it depend upon who is nearby? You know, maybe if your f siblings are nearby, you're more likely to issue an alarm call than if they're strangers. Right? So these are the kinds of things that you can try to study. Similarly, okay, so vampire bats, okay, it doesn't look like a very, uh, you know, sort of cuddly organism, but and it turns out, all right. So obviously, when they, right, so they, these guys they fly under the night and they suck blood from cattle and other animals, right? So okay, so that part is you know that's bad for the cattle. But what's interesting is that when they come, uh, they're not they're actually it's actually quite a difficult life that they lead, and that uh, it's often the case that they're not successful when they go out, for, uh, you know, to try to, to try to suck this blood. And what's observed is that vampire bats will actually regurgitate some of their blood to their family or friends that were unsuccessful in that night's hunting, right, which is an amazing behavior. Right? Uh, and then um, I'll show you uh, some examples of cooperative dynamics at the microscopic realm. Okay. All right, so the, the canonical um, game that we think about when thinking about cooperation and cheating uh, is um, this game called uh, Prisoner's Dilemma. Right? And it's a situation that actually is very familiar to all of us uh, from watching these um, Law and order type shows, right? So you you know there's like the, the two accomplices to a crime, 
They're brought in for questioning, but in separate rooms. Okay? And, you know, and the, the cop here is telling the, the suspect that, you know, it, you know, look, you know, he says, all right, so you know, we know that you have done something. We can get you on some moderate, um, moderate charge. And if you work with us and rat out your partner, then I'll let you off scot-free, and you know, we'll pin everything on the other guy. Okay? And of course, in the room next door, your accomplice is getting the same, same story. Right? So the question is, you know, what, are the, uh, what are the incentives in this situation? Right? And of course, it depends on the details of it, so we're going to specify. All right? So this is, uh, yeah, this is the prisoner's dilemma, where basically each player, the two prisoners or accomplices, uh, they have a choice regarding whether to confess or to remain silent. Okay. Now, what would be the best outcome is if they both remain silent. Okay, and this is best from the standpoint of the accomplice, right? So, right, so uh, from their standpoint, right, what would be best is if they both remain silent. Because then, you know, they only, they're going to be in jail, but just for a short period of time. Because then, um, because, because there's not enough evidence to, you know, to get them on the really serious charge. Okay. Uh, however, if you ask, you know, player A here, let's say that player A knows that player B is going to um, is going to remain silent. And then, from the standpoint of player A, he has a choice between these two outcomes. He can either remain silent, and that's one year, or if you think, oh, he could confess, then he doesn't get any jail time. Right? He's 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 let out right away. So from that standpoint, he ought to confess. Right? Okay, but then you say, oh well, all right. Well, what about this other? Let's say that I knew that my uh, partner over there was going to confess. Right, so I knew that I was going to be over, uh, going to be over here, on this column. Okay, well then we can look over here and say, oh, okay, actually here again, it's better to confess, because here we have five years for both of the accomplices if they both confess. Okay, so the idea of this prisoner's dilemma is, you know, it has to be such that the the jail times work out. But the idea is that it could be the case that independent of what your partner slash opponent, independent of what the other player is going to do, it could be better for you to confess, which in this case would correspond to the non-cooperative cheating option. Okay. Does this make sense, reading this chart? It's a little bit, a lot of numbers is kind of the problem. All right. the, key thi the key thing in this is that the, Na okay, so the Nash equilibrium is going to be confess, confess. Because you can ask, well, would either player have the incentive to change their strategy? Well, player A, the answer is no, because he, he would go from 5 to 20 years. Same thing, player B, go from 5 to 20 years. Okay. So in this situation, both players should confess, despite the fact that both players would be better off if they were to remain silent. So that's the key feature of this game. And that's why it represents something like a some form of cooperation, because they would like to cooperate and end up here, but it's very difficult to do because they're all, the individual incentives are always going to be such that they end up here on the top left, which is a worse outcome for both of them. Okay. Any questions about this before we move on? All right, some of the others maybe may, you know, will make more sense. Okay, so how is it that these sorts of things play out at the microscopic realm? Well, there are many, many situations where bacteria and other uh, of these microscopic organisms, they engage in some sort of collective behavior. So for example, one of the things that they often do is they secrete out enzymes to help break down complex sugars. Okay? So outside the cell could be a big, tasty piece of sugar, but it's just too big to pull in. Right? And then what are you going to do? Well, what you can do is you can send out an enzyme that's going to chop it up. And that makes a lot of sense, because you can imagine that in this environment where there's a complex sugar that you want to eat, if, and here cooperate is going to correspond to secreting that enzyme. Okay? So here, if you have a type of cell that actually does send out that enzyme to break down the sugar, it can grow to large population size, because you get a lot to eat. Right? Now you can ask, well, what, what about a different type of cell? Now, this is a type of cell that is a non-cooperator. In this case, it does not secrete that enzyme. Right? It, it doesn't get as much to eat. Okay? So based on this, the answer seems very simple. 
you'd say, well, the red cooperators that are engaging in this uh, cooperative behavior of sending out the enzyme to break down the sugar, it's more fit than the non-cooperator, the cheaters. And so you'd say, OK, well, evolution leads to higher fitness, so we should be done. Right? Okay, but here we have to ask, well, you, you, you can't only look at the fitness of those two strategies or cell types when they're alone. You also have to ask, well, what happens if they're together? Right? And that's the tricky thing. Because in a mixed population, it could be the case that the non-cooperators, these green guys, are actually more fit than the red ones, despite the fact that on their own, they're less fit. Okay? And this, again, comes to the, the issue of cost. Because you know, doing anything requires cost. Right? Yeah, it's going to slow you down in some way. So if you want to make a bunch of enzyme and send it out to break down the sugar, that's going to be something that it, it's going to slow you down. Because there are other things you could have done. You could have devoted all that energy into making new cells. Right? Whereas here, in a mixed population, those, those non-cooperators, those cheaters, they don't pay the cost of making that enzyme, but they still have other cells that are making the enzyme and breaking down the sugar. Okay. So what can happen is that in a mixed population of cooperators and cheaters, the cheaters can have an advantage. Okay. Right. So this can lead to evolution towards cheating, despite the fact that a pure cooperator population is more fit than a pure cheating population. Right. So this is capturing this essential dilemma of cooperation. Right? Just like in the prisoner's dilemma, the population would be better off if they were all cooperating, but then they evolve to a state of cheating. Okay. And this sort of uh, dynamic, actually, we can see in various laboratory systems. Okay. All right. um, and here, I just want to you know, close with um, what I think is a, very, a beautiful example of cooperation and cheating um, in uh, a single, well, normally single-celled organism that we uh, call Dicti because the full name is too hard to pronounce. All right. Um, all right so this is, uh, so, right, so they're normally single-celled uh, organisms, right, going around eating. But then if they can't find enough food, then they engage in this remarkable behavior where there are a large number of cells, uh, you know, tens of thousands of cells that come together to form something known as a slug. And indeed, in this form, it actually really does look like a slug. So you have tens of thousands of cells that come together, form this slug that crawls some distance before forming this thing it's like a fruiting body. Right, so the idea here is that by forming this structure, you, it's a form of long distance motility. Because okay? those cells, they were starving. There wasn't enough food there, so they want to get away. But the problem is you know, they can't fly. Right? So the, the, the next best thing is to do this, where a passing animal is just going to brush up against this, and um, then th this structure on top will be carried off to wherever that animal is going. Okay. So this is a response to starvation. Okay. But the challenge here, and, and it's a form of cooperation, very clearly, right? This is I, I mentioned building bridges. This is a skyscraper, right? But it's a skyscraper with a very odd behavior because this entire structure is composed of cells that are actually never uh, going to see the light of day. Those, those cells are at an evolutionary dead end. Right? They actually are not going to be able to have the option of reproducing in the future. Only the cells that are up here at top. Okay? So you can imagine, you know, if you were a cell, where would you like to be? On top. On top, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, if you only remember one thing, you, know, you want to be on top. Okay. Um, <laughs> right. And indeed, in this, si in this system, researchers have found that there are indeed mutants out there that are uh, less effective at forming these sorts of fruiting bodies, but are more effective at getting into the, um, this ball on top. Right? So this is a, f a form of cheating in order to enable them to get, to get away at the cost of all the, you know, all the suckers that are left down here. Right? And then, of course, there's a lot of questions you can ask about, you know, how is it that the cooperators can protect themselves from the cheaters? And there's evidence that they can try to exclude other genotypes. Also, maybe you know, in some regions, you try to just have um, you, you, all the cells be of the same genotype, the same, basically the same kind of cell. Because actually, if your neighbor is identical to you, then actually maybe you're OK with him getting to the top, and as long as you know, one of you is able uh, to pass on your genes. Right? So I think it's a really uh, an amazing example of cooperation and cheating uh, at that microscopic realm. 
All right, so with that, I will, um, I'll close just to try to remind us you know, what we've been talking about. All right, so one thing is just that uh, you know, there are lots of these situations uh, that correspond to some kind of game, if you want to think about it that way. And indeed, in those situations, there are even, uh, even lizards play games like the ro this rock, paper, scissors game. You know, we've also looked at a, a bunch of examples where the survival of the population is really, um, it really requires, in some cases, pretty extreme forms of cooperation, where there, in some cases, individuals really have to sacrifice for other individuals in the population. Right, so th it's tremendously important, but then it's also susceptible to possible cheater strategies. And so then you have to think about what are the mechanisms that the population can use in order to keep those cheaters from spreading too much. Uh, and finally, uh, I've, I've really been excited about the, uh, these beautiful kind of examples like this. And th I should, again, stress, this is not a system that I work on. But, um, but I think that it, it's really amazing to me how some of these ideas, like cooperation cheating, that we're all very familiar with and thinking about you know, throwing away trash on the side of the road and so forth, you know, that it, you know, it's, it's the kind of dynamic that really plays out at, across all levels of biological organization, you know, from human society all the way down to the microscopic realm. And I think it's just fascinating to see how the solutions that uh, evolution or society come up with are similar um, or are different. And with that, um, thank you for coming, and I'm happy to take any more questions. Yeah. So in the microscopic realm, the, the cheaters would be out competing the cooperative cells to a certain point, but the cheaters are also dependent upon yeah, the yeah. environment created by, so it's a self-limiting yeah. system, right? I don't know if it's an equilibrium, but there's got to be a back and forth, an oscillation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This, this is a really, this is a really good question. question. So, so um, there, there, there are circumstances, circumstances where the cheaters will spread so much that they can actually cause um, collapse or extinction of the, at least that local population. Right? So this would correspond to something that we, we call evolutionary suicide, where as a result of evolution, you do, you do get this. That being said, there, um, one of the things that my group has found is that in the vast ma majority of the situations that we look at, um, it is true that the cheaters can take advantage of the cooperators and spread, but um, it ends up balancing out where um, the, you know, when, the che when the cooperators are rare in the population, they actually have higher fitness than the cheaters. So in that case, it leads to a stable coexistence between cooperation and cheating in the population. Uh, and that, that basically arises because in a lot of situations, uh, the cooperators are cooperative, yet they retain some of the benefits of their behavior for themselves. Right? So this is like you, know, you, you make a lot of money, you, know, you, you, sh you, you share 99% uh, of it, but then you keep a little bit of it. And that uh, can actually be good because it actually helps the cooperators uh, to survive in the presence of these cheating strategies. Yeah. So with the, like the size fever, are, the, are they like greedy, or do they just want like the greater good? Like, like how do they decide which, which cells go to the top and which cells go to the top? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, right, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so indeed, this, this comes back to this thing about cooperation and cheating. I mean, so one of the things that I kind of like about these questions in the microscopic realm is that we don't have this intervening layer of psychology or morality or something that is, you know, is good to think about, but it, it does kind of muddle things somehow. Because you know, in, in the case of these cells, you know, it could just be that, that some of the cells, they have one version of a gene, some of them have another version of a gene. Right? And it's not that one is a good person and one's a bad person. It's just different versions of the gene. But then it has different consequences for the population. Um, and, and, you know, and then, of course, to ask, you know, what is it? You know, why are they doing it? You know, uh, it, it gets a little bit. Um, I would say that there are various evolutionary forces that can support cooperation in the population, and from that perspective, then some genotypes did evolve to engage in cooperation. But you know, of course, it's, you know, it's not a, it's not a moral issue. It's just, you know, it's, it's about the, you know the balance of evolutionary forces. And maybe one final question, and we'll quit. Uh, in the back. So I just want to challenge the notion uh, a bit of this, um, that mutation is always random. And I was going to bring an example from human medicine. And the example is uh, rheumatoid arthritis. It's, it's believed in general that rheumatoid arthritis is inherited, although it is a malele. It is already a mutation. And the, the really interesting study was done where they studied these in twins, identical twins. So whatever allele one had, the other one did as well. So 
you would exp expect the expression of arthritis in both, but that's actually not what happened. It, it, it is the concatenation of that allele with an environmental exposure of some sort, and it can't be any environmental exposure. It has to be a certain concatenation, which doesn't. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I'll just give you an example which doesn't feel at all random. You had to have a predisposition, and you had to have a trigger, and the trigger had to be non-random. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, there are a couple different issues at play here. So one is um, whether the initial mutation is, is random or not. And of course, then, then there are also various examples where we think that maybe it's not fully random. But yeah, so one question is the initial mutation. And then another question is the consequence of that mutation on the fitness or the phenotype of the organism. And indeed, as, as you're pointing out, there are many examples where genetically identical individuals will have will have different fates. And this, again, this is something that's true in humans as well as there are a lot of examples of phenotypic heterogeneity even in bacterial cells uh, that are, even in, in bacterial cells that are identical genetically, right? So there are a lot of cases where it's, you know, and of course, it's always going to be a mixture of the genetics and the environment for, any, for anything. And then for each uh, thing that you're interested in, you have to ask, what's the, uh, the balance between those two things? But, yeah. but even if you have the predisposition, you can't get triggered by anything. You yeah. have to be a specific concatenation. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that just didn't feel random to me, but you're, you're still feeling that that's random. Well, I, I, so I don't know. When, when, I, when I was saying random, random I was talking about the, um, the initial appearance of the mutation, right? And, and actually, the example that you're talking about, there was no appearance of the mutation. You're, you're talking about ge you have genetic, you have twins, and then, and then what is the consequence of their genotype, right? So that, that's what I was saying, is that the two separate issues, yeah. All right, with that, uh, thank you again for coming. And I'm happy to take more questions. So, yeah. Can I?